We're going to finish the book of Ephesians today. Overall theme of Ephesians has been the believer's responsibility to walk in accordance with his heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. And uh, in chapter 6 here, which is the one we're dealing with today, we're going to see the big overall exhortation. Uh, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you're going to be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our quiz from last week is um, true or false submission to proper authorities, part of the overall design of God for the well-being of mankind. Modeled by the Trinity, it is to be done by the church to Christ, and it is to be illustrated by husband and wife in marriage. True. Uh, Submission seems to be lacking in society today uh, to proper authorities. You see this uh, happening all the time, and uh, especially in kids who are just out of control. True or false, the construct of marriage is whatever man determines it to be. After all, we have to live as best we can in changing times with changing standards and morals. And what applied to the people in Paul's day does not apply to the modern world today. That's absolutely false. Uh, Construct of marriage is what God determined it to be. That hasn't changed. And uh, man doesn't have, uh, it's it's not a man-made construct. And by the way, standards and morals uh, don't change. Uh, God's standards and morals don't change. So what applies to people in Paul's day concerning marriage certainly applies to today's uh, standards and morals as well. So this whole concept of marriage can be whatever man wants it to be is totally false. This is just rebellion, flat out rebellion against God. True or false, the wife's submission to her husband is to be done willingly on her part, just as she willingly submits to Christ. And she benefits from these actions, and that's true. True or false, the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And this is a command for which the husband receives no direct benefit. He is to act towards her in ways that are consistent with God's will for her. That's what agape love is. He is to sacrifice for her, set her apart, lead the way in sanctification. He is to provide security for her to grow. And if he has done well and she has been willing uh, to deliver her as mature in Christ at the end of her life, and that's true. True or false, the wife's responsibility to love her husband as Christ loved the church. And so she has the same responsibilities as the husband toward her. If he is not shaping up, she should take the headship from him. She should hound him day and night with Bible verses and stop having sex with him until he comes into complete compliance. And this is false. Unfortunately, some Christian wives feel that that is their role and responsibility. And they will take headship away from their husband. They'll, they'll begin to lead the family. And uh, they will use uh, sexual relations as a bargaining chip or as a uh, leverage to uh, get the husband to comply with whatever uh, they believe uh, he needs to do. We're just going to jump right into the exposition of chapter 6. It's kind of, um, There's a lot of verses here today, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this is uh, within that third divine institution, family, children, or to obey their parents and the Lord. Children is the word technos, and it means boys and girls, still living at home, dependent on their parents, old enough to understand instruction. They are to hupa, Ko'uo, which means to be under hearing or to obey what your parents tell you to do. This requires the child to be walking in the spirit so that he or she is not in rebellion against their authority. Obeying your parents is obeying the Lord's will for you at that time in your life. The children are supposed to obey with the attitude that they are obeying, they are being obedient to the Lord. So Paul states, this is right, meaning before the Lord or well-pleasing to the Lord. He says it that way in Colossians 3.20, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Then Paul quotes the uh, Septuagint, 
LXX70 or the Old Testament Greek translation from Exodus 2012. This is one of the Ten Commandments, which is a summary of the Mosaic Law. The church is not under the Mosaic Law as our rule of life, but nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated for the church under the law of Christ. And this is one of those. Obeying is honoring the parents, both of them, mother and father. How exactly the long life promise applies under the law of Christ is kind of difficult to understand. It's pretty easy under the Mosaic Law. Provision was made for a disobedient, rebellious, violent child to be stoned to death. That would be really clear to a Jewish parent and child. But in the New Testament, that it be well with you probably refers to stability, discipline within the family and society since we don't have that command any longer to take our disobedient kids out and stone them. Today, it's difficult enough to simply execute any type of physical discipline regarding your children without being seen as uh, child abuse <clears throat> in, a size, in a society which has Satan corrupting the divine institutions of marriage and family. Then Paul gives the responsibility of the fathers toward their children. In a patriarchal society in which Paul is writing, the father had tremendous power over the family. He had absolute control over his children, even after they were married, if they lived with him. He could stone his brothers, sons, daughters, or wife if they enticed him to idol worship. He was able to sell his daughters into slavery or a posit on a positive note. Um, he was responsible for the education of his children, especially the sons. He was the one who delivered physical discipline. So knowing the power fathers had, Paul instructs them not to irritate or provoke their children, but to gently correct them and train them. It's one thing to spank a child in loving discipline and another thing entirely to beat a child in anger. Then he talks about slaves. Slaves be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So slavery in the time of Paul in Greece and Rome was not at all like what we imagine it to be based on black African enslavement in early America. In Paul's time, slavery was not based on skin color. Person could willingly sell themselves into it and later be freed from it. Slaves could become highly educated, trained in professions of importance. Some were or became Roman citizens with full rights. So as always, read your Bible in its historical and contextual setting to understand what's being said. Don't jump ahead and think you are going to apply some modern day concept to the uh, Bible as it was written in its historical setting. Paul was not an abolitionist, that is, a person against the institution of slavery. He simply recognizes the system that's in place and he instructs both the slave and the master as to their individual responsibilities. So with this in mind, Paul says to the Christian slaves, doulos, to hupa, kouo, meaning to be under hearing or listening, meaning to obey their earthly masters. It's a present tense imperative, a command to be continually followed. Many of the Christian slaves were working for pagan masters, so this made for a great witnessing opportunity, just as it does for Christians in the workplace today. In Paul's day, slaves outnumbered free men. With fear and trembling, this phrase is used elsewhere in the New Testament by Paul, and it seems to suggest nothing more than carrying out your duties with concern and with energy and doing a good job. Insincerity of your heart is the attitude of the slave in carrying out his work for his master. Uh, no pretenses or hypocrisy. So the idea being conveyed is that in working for the earthly master, the approach of the slave should be just like doing the work for the heavenly master who's Christ. So we do our work by faith and this pleases him. Now he turns to Christian masters. 
They're to treat their slaves with the same Christian principles that the Christian slave works for the master. So Christian masters shouldn't threaten their slaves. Christian masters are to always remember that both the slave and the master have one and the same master in heaven. And Christ will give no preference to one because he was rich and owned slaves and the other who was poor and had to sell himself self in as a slave. So then Paul is now bringing this letter into conclusion. He's talked about all these submission, wives and husbands, and now children and parents and slaves and masters. And so he's now finished with that part of the idea of submission. So now Paul is going to bring this to conclusion after he's taught all of the the doctrine in 1 through 3 and now the practice and so forth. And he's going to conclude this letter. So verse 10 is the marker for this with the word finally. So verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his, his might. So at first glance, when you read this in the English, it looks like you're told to toughen up, make yourself strong through self-effort. Men love verses like this until they understand what is being said. And this is the great thing about seeing these words in the Greek text. This is not you making yourself strong. It is calling for you to depend on the Lord to supply you with that strength. So this is not a guy verse. It's not, you know, take, take the guys off to a, a, a guy weekend and, uh, you know, beat them up and build them up into this uh, with this, these kinds of verses. This is a verse for men and women and boys and girls. So this word be strong is this word in duna mo o and it is a verb. It's present tense. It's passive voice. It's an imperative mood, second person plural. So it, it's important once in a while to kind of go into this Greek to show you the strength of this Greek grammar and how it would be understood by the hearers and readers of these Greek words. It means to render strong in power, to be enabled. It's inwardly strengthened, suggesting the strength in soul and purpose. But look a little deeper. It, it's good to see the grammar explain the word and what it is conveying in this context. So I'm just going to take a second and walk you through this grammar. I do this for some words, not all the words, but when you're really trying to kind of dig in here, this is how you do this. So this word is a present tense. It means that this is an action in process or state of being with no assessment of the action's completion. It's passive voice. So this is where you know, it takes it out of your hands of this guy thing, you know, self-effort. The subject, which is you, is being acted upon. The subject is the receiver of this verbal action. This is what's called a divine passive, meaning God is the agent who is doing the acting. It's an imperative mood the mood that normally expresses a command or an intention or an exhortation. It is not an expression of reality, but of possibility and volition or will, what we would call will. It's second person. This talks about the grammatical actors. First person is the speaker, that would be I. Second person is the person being addressed, that's you. And the third person is the person spoken about, he or they. It's plural, the feature in grammar that lets us know if one person, singular, or multiple people, plural, are referred to or are performing the action. So to paraphrase verse 10, it means finally be being constantly strengthened by being in the Lord constantly receiving his great strength. So all of us can have this you don't have to go to the gym and do barbells or Pilates to get it. So that sounds great, but how do I get it then? So verse 11 is going to answer that question. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So this is the purpose of getting strong and how you get this strength as you put on the full armor of God. So the answer to the question about how 
we be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Paul tells us to do something. Put on the full armor of God. The word is enduo, which is the word for put on, and it means to envelop in or to hide in or to clothe with. This is a command to all believers. It's a personal responsibility of every believer to do this and to have this armor on at all time. It is not a matter of if an attack will come, it is simply when. We are commanded to have this armor on at all times so that we are ready at all times. If you don't have it on when the attack comes, you're going to suffer greatly for not being prepared. You will have disobeyed a direct command from our commander in chief. The armor you see that you're putting on is God's armor and it is specifically designed to protect you as a believer against the strategies of the devil. We'll talk more about that in a second. The full armor is the word panoplia, and it is two words combined, whole and weapons. So literally, it means all the weapons, to be wholly armed in all the weapons of warfare. Shield, sword, lance, helmet, shin guards, breastplate. The armor, however, comes from God as its source or is provided by him. Paul is simply providing a word picture from a fully armed Roman soldier so the Christian warrior can better understand the spiritual armament God is providing him to wear. And so what is the purpose of this armor? Are we going to go out and fight and conquer new land like the Romans did, taking the Roman Empire? No. Paul's been telling us about how we were to walk previously. Remember, walk in unity, walk in holiness, walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. Now he tells us not how to walk, but how to stand. And as you're going to see, this is not a strategy for offense. It's a strategy for defense. We're not out conquering, but we are now defending what has already been conquered. Christ has already overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are simply holding ground, defending the church, always ready to, get, to give an answer. We're defending against the, strategy of the, the strategies of the devil towards the church, which are lies, totally false doctrine, confusion, which is ignorance and distortion of doctrine, and counterfeit doctrines that are maybe 99% true and 1% false. Many Christians don't understand that they're in a war with the schemes of the devil constantly, and so they're never properly armed for the battle. Paul wants every Christian ready at all times, armed and alert, prepared to stand firm. That is, to be ready to defend the faith, the truth, and the sound doctrine. The Christian defense is Christ-centered knowledge in every area of life. We'll be studying this next in the letter of Colossians. Why? Satan hates Christ and his church. Because the devil is always at work with his methodia, his schemes. These are his cunning arts, his deceit, his craft, his trickery. He has a strategy that he follows to keep those in Adam as captives. They're already separated from God by their sins and trespasses. They suppress the truth. They know God but refuse to acknowledge him. They're called the sons of disobedience and the children of the devil already. He doesn't need to do much with these people. But Christians... Christians take a lot of work, and that's where he focuses his schemes, the lies, the confusion, and the counterfeits. He does some of his best work inside the church. Paul's talking here to Christians who were once in that lost condition in Adam, but they're now in Christ. And when we're fully armed, we're then able to hold our ground against whatever strategies the devil throws at us. So we have to put on the armor provided by God 
and we are continually being made strong in him and his strength. So verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So Paul uses this Greco-Roman wrestling analogy here. Thayer's defines this as a contest between two in which each endeavors to throw the other, and which is decided when the victor is able to press and hold down his prostate antagonist, namely hold him down with his hand upon his neck. The loser then has his eyes gouged out and was blind for the rest of his life. Now the Ephesians would have taken Paul's analogy very seriously. Today more than ever we should take this very seriously because we're also wrestling against the powers of darkness and the results can be just as spiritually disastrous. Satan senses that the end of the church age is near just as we do. He's going to be viciously attacking Christians in the church in these last days of the church. It's called apostasy. The church is going apostate, departing from the truth because they're not fully armed. They're going to go especially from the gospel of grace that results in salvation as opposed to the false gospels that don't save anybody but leave them condemned. As Christians, Paul says we are not wrestling against physical opponents, flesh and blood. The battlefield is in the heavenlies. The enemies are fighting for the souls of men. So we're in a spiritual battle with the devil and his fallen angelic beings. We will study that whole structure another time. There are whole sections of what's called systematic theology that deal with Satan and demons. It's called Satanology and Demonology, and it is way too much information to cover here. In brief, what Paul describes here are rulers, which are called RK. These are fallen angels of high rank and powers, which is exousia, which are lower rank fallen angels with delegated authority. Then Paul describes another enemy, world forces of this darkness, which in Greek is cosmokrator or cosmic powers. This is describing Satan and his fallen angels as having influence over the entire cosmos. Their plans are so comprehensive and their influence is so great as to be terrifying. These beings are described as spiritual beings of evil or wickedness. It's their very nature to do evil. Their abode is described as the third heaven, and this is where God lives. They will remain there until the middle of the tribulation when they will be cast out and down to the earth. Revelation 12, 9 and 10 tells us this. So this becomes a bit confusing. Where exactly are we fighting this battle if they're in heaven and we're on the earth? Well, we know we are positionally already seated with Christ in heaven, but physically we're still on the earth until the rapture. These fallen angels have a home in heaven, but they have the ability to move freely back and forth to the earth. So positionally we have already won, but experientially we are ready to fight down here. So this seems to imply the battle is a spiritual one, being fought for the souls of men in the spiritual realms on the earth. Verse 13, Therefore take up the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. So having explained his reasoning, Paul says, look, take up the full armor of God. Take up is the word ana lambano. It's a command. It's given with military force of being obeyed at once and for all times forward. When I read this word, it reminds me of my time in the Navy aboard ship in a war zone. As we were entering dangerous areas, the captain would tell the quartermaster to get on the ship's public address system, sound an alarm, and announce general quarters, general quarters, all hands, man your battle stations. No matter what, every person aboard that ship rushed to his designated pre-assigned duty station aboard the ship, ready to defend that ship and take on all enemies. In other words, it was not a drill. This is the real thing. And this is what Paul is conveying here. 
the battle is on. Our captain has called us to general quarters. Keep your armor on at all times. The fight is on. This is what Paul is telling us. It's so hard for us to see this need because we can't see the enemy at the door. It's a spiritual battle <coughs> being fought so craftily by Satan and his demons and often so subtly and for so long, we just say, relax, things are really not that bad. Until we get a stand down order, we can't do that. Satan and his demons will target you. It gives him great pleasure to make life miserable for believers. If he can get to them, <coughs> to all the unbelievers, he works continuously, keeping them captive to a philosophy of life without God. Humanism is the preferred religion of Satan because it excludes God and exalts man. So the command is take up the full armor of God, but why? So that you'll be able to resist in the evil day. Oh, what's the evil day? Must be a particular day because it has a definite article before it. Expositor says it's the day of violent temptation and assault, <coughs> whatever that may come against us during the present time. Satan or his demons may attack at any time and then withdraw, waiting for a more opportune time. <coughs> this is what he did with Jesus. Jesus was always prepared, and we have been given the armor of God so that we can also be prepared. So having taken up the armor, having it on, we're able to resist this attack because our of our strong defensive armor that God's given us to wear. And then Paul says, to stand firm. Christ has already won the battle. We're defending the ground. Since we have obeyed our commander in chief, having done everything we were told to do, we're simply to stand. We're on our guard, in our armor, at attention, defensive posture, alert to any attack at any moment. So verse 14 says, stand firm therefore. Having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So verses 6, 14 through 20 are one sentence in the Greek. It's a description of the armor of God, how it's to be used. Paul was in chains, guarded by a Roman soldier, but he may have also been thinking of the divine warrior of Isaiah 59. It's the armor of the king of kings at his second coming to claim what is rightfully his. The whole creation, which he paid for by his substitutionary atonement and victory at the cross. Isaiah 59, 16 through 18 says, Then in his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle according to their deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries and recompense to his enemies. To the coastlands he will make rep recompense. God has given us similar armor because we are united with Christ, except for the garments of vengeance. We share in his victory but Christ judges those outside the church. So stand, therefore. This is the third time we're told to stand. So stand means don't advance, don't retreat, hold the ground. We're holding ground against Satan and his demons in the spiritual battle that Satan is conducting using lies, confusion, and counterfeit. So stand against these strategies by having on the full armor of God so you're not tossed about by every false doctrine that comes along. The other English translations don't capitalize the armor in 14 through 17 as if it's coming directly from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, which means most commentators to stay with the Roman soldier analogy for describing the armor. So we're going to look at each piece in that way as the armor of the Roman soldier. So here's a picture of that um, Roman soldier's armor. Um, you can see uh, on the left-hand side here, there's a brief description of the various pieces of that armor. Um, you get the Roman definitions of those, and then you get the definition 
of the armor of God, as Paul has written it here in Ephesians. Uh, I have the Word document attached to this, so if you'd like to have this picture, uh, you can certainly have it, or you can stop the video and uh, uh, do a uh, screenshot or something and pick it up yourself if you'd like to. But I'm going to describe it for you anyway. First piece is having girded your loins with truth. And, and this is, again, this is your responsibility. This is to be done with urgency immediately, according to the grammar. So the soldier would tie this piece of armor around his waist, then it hung like a breech cloth, which I have no idea what a breech cloth is, but an apron, I understand. So it's an apron. It was to protect the vulnerable areas, including the thigh area. And so this is the soldier's center of gravity. So the analogy here is truth is our center of gravity in order to stand firm. Truth is that which corresponds with reality. God is truth. God has revealed truth to mankind in the written word, the Bible. So the Christian worldview is based on the literal interpretation of the Bible, where philosophy, science, and history agree with the word of God, they're true. And where they disagree, they are the strategies of the devil at work. Lies, confusion, counterfeits. Just go to the, go to the creation account. We believe the, that the earth is uh, somewhere around 6,000 years old based on what the Bible tells us. Uh, of course, the lie is uh, evolution. And that the, it's, uh, the earth is billions of years old. Uh, both of those can't be true. Well, we believe the Bible's true and evolution is false. Second piece, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, this is a defensive piece of armor designed to protect your chest and back where your vital organs are located, and you're responsible for having already put this on, having it on in the preparation of an attack. Soldier had uh, one of various types of metal uh, breastplates, and we have ours, that is the imputed righteousness of Christ. So now, as you walk in the Spirit, you walk in His righteousness, and this protects your heart from the attacks of the devil. Jesus defended Himself with the truth of Scripture, and we too must know Scripture to effectively defend ourselves against these attacks. Third thing He describes is having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Again, you're responsible for having put these on already. These shoes were designed to hold ground, not to run. They had studs to dig in. The soldier could dig in his feet and stay planted to defend his area. Now we defend with the gospel of peace. This is the antidote to the lies, confusion, and counterfeit of the devil. 1 Corinthians 15. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, and which you also stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. That had to do with believing that Christ died for your sins, but that he wasn't raised from the dead. Well, you have to believe both of those things. Christ died for your sins and was raised from the dead. First of all, the first importance that I received that Christ died for your sins, died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised again on the third day. For believers to stand firm, we must be absolutely certain that we have salvation, assurance of our eternal security, and we do. Knowing for certain that you have believed the true gospel gives you the confidence to stand. There are a lot of denominations that do not have eternal security. They believe in something called lordship salvation. Uh, they have something called spurious faith, or they believe some kind of an Armenian view, which means that uh, somehow you can lose your salvation. Uh, neither of those views are true. If you don't have eternal security, assurance of your salvation, how can you stand firm? We can dig in our heels and resist whatever attacks come our way because we know it is Christ who did it all on our behalf and it is Christ who keeps us saved. We're in the what's called the double grip of grace. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And here's the double grip. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Thus the double grip of grace. Verse 16, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So in addition to what you have put on, you're also to take up a few items. First is the shield of faith. 
Shield was about two and a half feet wide and four feet tall, designed to prevent arrows and javelins from getting to the body. It was covered with canvas and dipped in water to prevent flaming arrows from causing the wooden part of the shield to burn. For the analogy to the Christian shield, the shield is faith. We're to walk by faith, trusting God's word. Satan's lies are often like fiery darts or arrows, and as we walk by faith, these are extinguished by knowing and trusting the word of God. Second, take the helmet of salvation. The word's actually to grasp it. It was usually hot and uncomfortable to put on uh, when faced with impending, impending danger, like the last thing you would put on. Again, it's your responsibility to put it on and have it on, and this likely refers to our being overcomers. We are standing in the total confidence because Christ has already overcome. Because he has overcome and we are in Christ, we too are overcomers. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's you. If you believe the gospel, you're an overcomer. This means we can continue to win daily battles against the cosmic powers and the spiritual warfare we're facing. Third, the sword of the Spirit. So we are to have grasped both the helmet and the sword at the same time. The sword is the only real offensive weapon in the bundle that we have seen. It's the Roman Machaira, a short double-edged sword about two feet long. It was the sword that was most effective in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Christian sword is the Word of God. It's the sword of the Spirit because it originated with the Spirit and can only be effectively administered through the power of the Spirit. We speak the Word of God when confronted with wicked cosmic powers. We fight like the Romans did as a unit together with the local church, each doing his or her part in standing firm with the whole armor of God. And then Paul gets to verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now that we have prepared with the whole armor of God and standing in the strength of the Lord, we pray and make our request to God at every opportunity. We pray in the power of the Spirit as we walk in the Spirit. We pray for the saints around the world who are every bit or more under attack and persecution as we are. As tough a guy as Paul was, he was always praying for others and was always asking for prayer so that he could carry out his assignment of getting the gospel to the Gentiles and to make known the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of gospel, of course, is that Jews and Gentiles were now united in the one new body, the church. You see in these uh, verses above the same theme re repeated about how to live the Christian life. Trust, obey, pray. And in the verses above, the preparation we need to make and the recognition of the enemy we are fighting. We learn that it isn't other people that we're fighting against. Recognizing it's a spiritual battle and how we are to fight it is critical if we're going to be successful. And then verse 21, but that you may also know about my circumstances, how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Ephesians and Colossians were written about the same time as we learned from both letters that a man named Tychicus would be bringing news to both the Ephesians and Colossians about, Paul, about how Paul was doing. Tychicus would be carrying both letters with him. This man became a traveling companion of Paul's right after the Ephesian riots in Acts 20. In the end, Tychicus would actually carry five of Paul's letters, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And then finally, verse 23, Peace be to you, <coughs> brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Peace and grace are reversed from how Paul opened the letter. In chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But here he reverses it with peace first and then grace. Paul's last words to the Ephesians turned out to be prophetic in a sort of negative way. The same group who Paul had given thanks for earlier for their great faith in Christ, their love for the saints, were now second generation believers and something has gone wrong according to Revelation 2. 
Thirty years from the time of this letter is written, John on the Isle of Patmos records a letter from Jesus Christ to the church at Ephesus. In Revelation 2.4, But I have this against you, that you left your first love. Therefore remember from where you've fallen, repent, and do the deed you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Why did this happen? How did this happen? Purely speculating, perhaps it has something to do with what we just studied. Perhaps the second generation failed to see the need for the army of God, armor of God and they let their guard down. Seems they were still doing a lot of good things, but they somehow had put their love of Christ in second or third place and all their good works in first place. Satan's deceptive schemes include diversionary tactics to turn our love, sto- love towards our self-achievements. Christ wants our love and loyalty first. The good works will follow as we walk in the Spirit. When we reverse these, we leave our, lo- our first love, like the Ephesians did. Some applications, the idea of Christian submission to proper authority structures continues with parents and children, slaves and masters. Romans 13 gives us an additional area where proper submission to authority is right. Society can't function properly without authority structures. The authorities are also to recognize they are likewise accountable to God in the proper use of their authority. Makes me think about our current government structure and uh, things that are going on there. Uh, I'm not sure those people have any clue that they are going to be held accountable for what they're doing. And then secondly, the armor of God section is not a nice little word picture that you can choose to read about and not obey. It's a direct command from our commander in chief to go to general quarters because the battle is on. You can't always see it directly because you can't see the enemy. People are not our enemies. Satan and his demons are. The battle is spiritual. You can see the effects of it all around you on the nearly 8 billion people on the earth and the effects on the earth itself. We're commanded to be fully dressed for battle in the armor of God, has, pro- has provided, and at all times to be fully dressed for the battle in the armor God has provided in order to stand. We're, we are not holding ground as overcomers. We are holding ground as overcomers, not taking ground. Sorry, that's a mistake there. We are holding ground as overcomers, not taking ground as conquerors. Jesus Christ has already conquered all that needs to be conquered. The devil's schemes consist of lies, confusion, and counterfeits. And we defend against these with our armor and defeat them with the word of God, which is our only offensive weapon. Next week, we're going to do an introduction to the letter of Colossians, unless the Lord comes and gets us, which would be just a wonderful thought. So Maranatha, come Lord Jesus.